Uh, my name's Richard Ray Martins. I head up the Oxford Parkinson's Disease Centre, but I'm a bit of an interloper here today. I'm not involved in the, the clinical side of this. So I'm just particularly thrilled and delighted to be able to be here today to share with you some of the work that's going on on the scientific side of the, of the Parkinson's programme, and of course, to celebrate our refunding, and particularly to celebrate it with you. So I'm sure you'll have picked up on the way in your newsletter, and you'll see a picture on the front of right of about eight rather nervous looking investigators just before we went in to be grilled by the panel back in May. Um, but I'm pleased to say that, uh, uh, that we have been refunded for five years starting February 2015. And the reason I know that is because I read it in the newspaper. Uh, so this is um, uh, the Oxford Mail. Uh, came to visit uh, our lab to take some pictures. Uh, decided to pay, take a picture of Dana, who'd only just started about two weeks ago, and asked her why it was important that we'd be refunded, but she made a very sensible reply, so we had a nice article in the Oxford Mail, so that's good. And I'd also just like to, to start by paying particular tribute to Michelle and her clinical team for all her hard work. You will know them all from your clinical visits, a hugely dedicated, enthusiastic team of young doctors, and they've done a sterling job uh, putting together a group of, of about a thousand patients. Uh, we thought of giving a bottle of champagne to the thousandth, um, uh, but we thought they would pick out one as more important than the rest, and they're not. The 999th and thousandth and one are tremendously important as well. When we were awarded this in 2010, they said we couldn't do it. They said that Michelle did not have the experience of putting together a cohort group like this, but her, with her tremendously supportive team and with your support, we've done it. So a big hand, I think, to Michelle and her team. <laughs> Um, but of course it's not really down to them at all, it's down to you. Um, and I've been really moved by the support that you've provided for us. I think I now count many of you as my friends. I came along to your carol service in December. There's a picture of that in the newsletter as well if you have a look. Um, and particularly thank you for signing up for the study, but coming not just once, but coming back time and time again, because it's that longitudinal aspect. It's measuring all the same symptoms, not every 18 years, but every 18 months that's made this such an important study. <laughs> Uh, and there's many different ways that you can define the value of a patient cohort. One is the size of the group we put together, so it's about just over a thousand of you. One is the depth of information that you provide to us, and the other is the enthusiasm of the support that you provide to our work. And taking all these together into account, I don't think there's a group like you anywhere else in the world. And Michelle and I should know that. We go to conferences, we discuss this work. But the support that you have for our work and the number of you that we've put together um, that make, I think, the study that we do so valuable. And we know that without you, we couldn't do any of it. OK, so now some science. So what we're going to do today is to tell you a bit about how uh, skin cells can help us understand Parkinson's. And this is a, a picture that I think summarises essentially the programme we've been able to put together of multidisciplinary lots of different disciplines working together, translational neuroscience, not just research for the research, but how can we translate it to a better clinical outcome for Parkinson's patients. So we have um, Michelle in uh, consultation, patient, David, many of you will know him, uh, who, who do, uh, we has appears on our video, so working with you, you guys, and then you're providing us biosamples, in particular skin samples, which I'll tell you about today, that enable us to go and, in this case, study neurons from skin cells. I'll tell you how we do that. And we'll study the neurons and understand how the, uh, the disease progresses. And then, in work I won't tell you about today, we also have a number of animal models. We've made rats and mice with Parkinson's that we can test our potential therapies on. And ultimately, we'll be able to move new therapies back into the clinic. So today is all about skin cells, but it's also about skin cells and it's about stem cells. So what is a stem cell? Well. One of the first pieces of experimental evidence we have for the investigation of uh, stem cells is shown here. Uh, this is an unfortunate chap called Prometheus. He upset Zeus by, by stealing the secret of fire and passing it on to mortal man. This upset Zeus and he condemned Prometheus to be chained to a rock. And every night an eagle would come down and peck out his liver. The next morning the eagle would then fly off. However, 
What this experiment demonstrated was the tremendous regenerative capacity of the liver stem cells <laughs> to then replenish the liver during the day, rather quicker than it would have happened, but during the day. Unfortunately for Prometheus, the eagle returned the next evening, pecked out the liver, and as far as I know, it's still going on. <laughs> but what the results from this experiment showed us is that stem cells are cells that can divide without limit. Stem cells can regenerate tissue, and they have a tr uh, tremendous ability to make different cell types. So stem cells have been studied for a long time, typically in the context of development. So when you have a, an embryo, the embryo is full of embryonic stem cells, which then develop to make different types of body cells to populate our body. And also, secondly, within our body, we have many adult stem cells that are involved in tissue repair. So we can think of stem cells generating body cells, either through embryonic development or as an adult for adult stem cell repair, to repair tissue. As you've seen on this uh, slide here, as often in life, things seem to go left to right. And it sometimes takes uh, a bit of a genius to think, well, why should things always go left to right? And it was this chap here called Shinji Yamanaka, working um, in Japan, and came up with this idea that maybe it doesn't always have to go left to right. Maybe we can turn the arrow round. And he had the idea that we could take body cells from an adult, use a technique called cellular reprogramming, and he identified four genes that we could use to reprogram a cell that had a, thought it had a terminal function, in this case of being a skin cell, for example, and turn it round and persuade it to go backwards to become a stem cell. Um, and this tremendously valuable work was published in the leading journal called Cell in, back in 2006. That means they outlined the methods for turning a body cell back into a stem cell. And so this... Uh, so the main example of this as we use today is to be able to turn skin cells into stem cells. So Shinji Yamanaka published this work in 2006. And with absolute lightning speed uh, for the Nobel Prize Committee, uh, in 2012, uh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology, uh, together with John Gurdon, shown also in the photograph for some of the early pioneering work he'd done in part in Oxford about uh, 30 years ago, 30 to 40 years ago, showing that some of this work would in principle be possible. So the idea to take through to the rest of the talk is that we can take these skin cells, use these genetic tricks, these reprogramming methods to turn those skin cells back to the stem cells. The important thing, of course, to remember is that it is a stem cell that has come from this person. So all the genetic information in that stem cell is just as it was in the person with the skin cell. And so this has been a revolutionary technology across a wide range of, of areas of medicine. And it, it means that we can generate any cell type now from a person using a, a skin sample. So uh, we can take a, a skin sample that gives these cells called fibroblast cells we can then perform the genetic reprogramming to then make what we call in the trade induced pluripotent stem cells. They're induced, we've made them. They're pluripotent, they have many different fates, and they are stem cells. So shown here is this example. We could turn these uh, stem cells into cardiomyocytes, into adipocytes, fat cells, a uh, whole different range of types of uh, nerve cells, neurons, brain cells, or into um, pancreatic cells, for example. And I think this method is particularly revolutionizing studies of brain diseases because it's previously not been possible to take out uh, the brain cells, the neurons that we wish to study from deep inside the brain to study and grow them. You can take a muscle biopsy, so it perhaps hasn't transformed uh, work in other areas as much as it's going to, to transform work in, into studying uh, neurological diseases, in particular in our case looking at Parkinson's. So where of course do these uh, skin cells come from? They come from you guys, and this is what we do with them, and this is why we need the, the samples. So uh, this slide, rather busy slide, but it essentially shows you uh, what we're doing and, and how we use this method. Uh, so this is uh, Michelle uh, taking a, a sample from a member of our cohort, uh, Derek Underwood, uh, taking uh, the skin biopsy, and then that's taken back to the uh, laboratory uh, where one of our team, either uh, Jane Voles or Sam Everts, work in the lab, take this skin sample, cut, into, cut it into lots of little bits, put it in a, a, a plastic tissue culture dish, and the cells and the bits of tissue fall to the bottom of the, the dish and sit there. 
And so you can see, I'll show you a lot more photographs of this in a minute, but here's the lump of skin here. And growing out, it takes about two to three weeks uh, to fill uh, a dish about six centimetres across. Uh, with these fibroblasts, they grow out from this skin, uh, fill up the dish, um, and then they're frozen down. So we have these uh, cells uh, stored in liquid nitrogen. They'll be, we have them forever. And then they're also then, now we take them on for reprogramming. So the reprogramming work is done by Jane Vowles and Sally Cowley, who work in the Oxford Stem Cell Facility in the Dunn School, about 50 metres that way. Uh, and what they're able to do is to take the uh, skin cells, the fibroblasts, and deliver to them, using a, um, a virus, four different genes that will make the proteins and turn skin cells into stem cells. And stem cells have a particular morphology. Have, they grow like little molehills of cells. And you can spot the ones that have been correctly reprogrammed, pick them out of the dish, and grow them on. And then my own lab uh, uh, is part of our centre. Uh, Liz Hartfield and Hugo Fernandez have been working to turn these stem cells uh, into the dopamine neurons, this subtype of brain cells that are, are dying off in Parkinson's. So that's the, the principle. It's been called a disease in a dish technology. We're now able to grow these neurons that we want to study in the lab dish for the first time. Be able to compare the brain cells, the neurons have come from patients and from controls, and understand better how the early neuronal dysfunction happens. These neurons probably won't die in the dish, the, the dopamine neurons in people, in patients, will live happily for 60, 65 years. So we don't necessarily expect in a month or so these cells to die, but we can study how they start to go wrong. So we've got a few pictures of what we can see when we do it. So this is uh, a lump of skin tissue. This is when we first take the sample, uh, cut in little bits, put it in the bottom of the dish, sinks to the bottom of the dish. We can see it on the microscope. Lots of densely packed cells, but no cells growing out yet. So we then Wait, wait a week or so. And this is the lump of skin tissue up here. And you can see the, the fibroblasts, these long flattened cells growing out across the dish uh, from the lump of skin tissue. Wait a bit longer, for maybe a couple of weeks. We've started to, this is the lump of tissue up here and this fibroblasts have grown out across from the tissue lump and started to fill the dish. At this point we'd harvest the cells and freeze them and then some of these cells we'd uh, put back on the bottom of the dish and then infect them with these viruses that have these reprogramming uh, genes. And they will reprogram these fibroblasts at a very small percentage, but the efficiency is low, but it's fine, into the stem cells. And the stem cells will grow as a molehill-shaped <coughs> pile of cells, um, and they'll grow and expand. So we expand <coughs> the stem cells and freeze them. And then we then start to, we then take the stem cells and start to turn them into to brain cells, into neurons. So we plate them uh, back out. So this is now a lump of stem cells. And we started to add to the tissue culture dish various growth factors that are found in the brain during development that persuade stem cells to become dopamine neurons. So we leave it there for a while. And then uh, you may be able to see in this bottom right-hand corner, the cells have started to, to change shape. Uh, they've started to send out uh, long processes, they've started to, uh, to elongate, and we leave them and leave them after about six, seven or eight weeks. What we have in the bottom of the dish is a bit like this. So this is now um, uh, neurons up here, brain cells, and they've sent these axons, these electrical connecting cables running across the dish, um, and it's this, these long axons that are a remarkable feature of neurons that conduct electrical messages and, and, and transport protein along them that we wish to study. And then, uh, this is under light microscopy, and what you can then do is to stain for particular proteins of interest to understand what neuron subtype, what brain subtype you've got. Um, and this is uh, shown here. We've stained for two different uh, proteins. Um, in red, it's a protein that just defines a brain cell, defines a neuron. But in green, it's the type of protein that confirms that this is a, a dopamine neuron that is the uh, type of neuron we wish to study. So we can compare the images under immunofluorescence, it's called, these bright uh, protein stains by light microscopy. And uh, you'll see the BBC website address down here. That the BBC became interested in this when we started this work um, and came to visit. And that was great fun. 
So this was uh, when the BBC came to visit and we got articles on both the main 6 and 10 o'clock news. Uh, this was about three or four years ago, um, which was tremendous publicity for our work and tremendous publicity for Parkinson's UK who fund us, so it was so important to do. So this is taking the, the biopsy and uh, this is um, uh, Palad Ghosh, the BBC science correspondent who was coming to do this piece and filming. He's standing in front of the camera, opening and closing an empty tissue culture dish, empty plastic dish, pretending to do something useful, but the guy who's actually doing the work, <laughs> as ever, is Sam Everts tucked in the back there, who's processing the sample in the, in the tissue culture hood. So it then takes about six months of hard graft and effort to go from this to the dopamine neurons. So Palab went away and came back six months later uh, and was able to uh, take further film of this. I think there should be more immunofluorescence on primetime news. So I was delighted when they put these images out uh, and an interview and, and, and gave us some great publicity. So that was a little while ago, but it, this work is important. It's really captured imagination um, uh, in the country. Why do we want to do this? Well, there's four reasons I think we really want and need to be able to grow and study the uh, brain cells um, in the dish. We need to understand that the cellular pathways to Parkinson's, we need to understand in a way we can study and grow these dopamine neurons, what's the difference? Why are they functioning differently? What's what we call the cellular phenotype? What's the way in which they function and dysfunction differently to control neurons? And this will hope will enable us to understand why the dopamine neurons are dying off um, in a Parkinson's patient brain. And um, we will do this in particular, we have a clue, uh, we have a great source of potential information in some of the genetic Parkinson's cases. So these rare cases where people have a genetic change that's led to the Parkinson's, and that means that the, the cells that we get and study will have that genetic change, and they're more likely to have a, a difference in their cell biology. So we're working on on the genetic cases and then moving that understanding into the, the sporadic common forms. We can also work to support and better understand the clinical findings. So um, there's a phrase here, the cellular basis of disease stratification, lots of long words. Stratification means that Parkinson's will develop differently in different people. Fard showed us the, the five different ways in which Michelle and the team think Parkinson's can develop. So for example, some people will get dyskinesia quicker than others. Why? as a result of L-DOPA treatment, and can we study that and understand using the cells in the dish? We can also work um, to support a biomarker discovery. So we can, uh, the, there's a big effort in the centre going on to study patient blood samples to see if there's proteins that are present in Parkinson's patient blood that isn't in control, or the same proteins are present but slightly differently folded maybe. Uh, so what we can do is we're studying the, the growth medium in the laboratory that we use to grow these cells. We bathe these cells in a growth medium. We change the medium every two to three days. Are there proteins present? Has something been secreted from the patient neurons into this growth medium that we can study and compare that to the changes that we found um, in patient blood samples? And ultimately, the point of this is to have a, a, a disease in a dish. As it says, we'll have a a system where we can grow cells in the dish and understand the changes that are happening in Parkinson's cells, and ultimately to be able to screen for small molecules that in the tissue culture dish can change or correct this cellular phenotype. And this work will be greatly enhanced by um, uh, something called the UK Dementia Platform, uh, which was launched uh, um, uh, end of last year. Uh, so in 2013, David Cameron launched the Prime Ministerial Dementia Challenge uh, and has put a lot of money through the Medical Research Council into dementia work. Um, Parkinson's is a leading cause of dementia, so we'll be able to use and access some of those funds. And, and Sally Cowley and myself have obtained three million pounds from that to set up a stem cell centre here in Oxford at the end of this year, beginning of next, to work on some of these things for these um, uh, cells that we get from, from you. So the renewal of the Parkinson's programme and this stem cell equipment is, is really well, nicely comes together. So we've been working away on these neurons, on these brain cells. A qu huge question, of course, is what's different? Why do, how do Parkinson's neurons differ from healthy neurons, and how might we uh, study that? So we have growing in our lab at the moment and all the time, a large number of these stem cell neurons from patients and from controls, and we're looking at different ways that they may be different. So what do neurons do for a living? Neurons conduct electrical activity. So it may be that the neurons that have come from from patients and controls have different ways of conducting this electrical activity. And we're certainly looking at that, but it's, um, we haven't found key differences there yet. 
Maybe it's in chemical release. So um, what, what neurons do is they have electrical activity, and that stimulates the release of chemicals, neurotransmitters such as dopamine. We found some uh, important differences in dopamine release between our Parkinson's rats and mice and controls. So that's a different arm of the work. We haven't looked yet for differences in, in dopamine release in our neurons from patients in the dish. Maybe it's in energy. So uh, we all sometimes feel we run out of energy, um, but these guys are the people who are making it for us. These are the mitochondria inside cells uh, that are generating energy, and the dopamine neurons that die in Parkinson's have a huge energy demand. So maybe those neurons have run out of energy, and this leads to, to, to them dying. We're looking at that, um, and data are starting to come in. But the bit that we've had more success is uh, understand some key features is in some of the fundamental cell biology processes that happen inside a cell, including neurons, uh, to keep them going day to day. And that's some of the findings that we've we found, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about. So neurons live a long time. Neurons live three score years and ten. It's a long time for a cell to live. It doesn't divide. It doesn't um, sort of regenerate itself. It has to. It's a long-lived cell. And so it has to recycle its content. So all cells uh, will recycle proteins for reuse, especially neurons, uh, because they, they have to live for three score years and ten, so they have to recycle what they've got. And they have a particular way in which they do that uh, down here. So here's some items, some protein items that the cell wishes to recycle. So it engulfs them in a, in a membrane. This orange uh, circle here engulfs the things that are going to be recycled. And then fuses, this structure fuses with a lysosome, which is an acidification process that then uh, degrades and recycles the, the contents inside uh, this part of the cell. So all cells are taking proteins all the time and putting them in the recycling bin. And the Parkinson's neurons that we've worked with um, do a lot of this. They have a lot of protein that they need to recycle. They have a big need for this. So they have a need for a big recycling bin. But unfortunately, the capacity to do the recycling doesn't work. So you've got a big demand for recycling, but the recycling plant has shut down. And that means that there's a protein crisis inside the cell. The proteins will accumulate. This is a uh, rubbish dump here. The plastic uh, uh, containers are not being recycled. They've started to accumulate and pile up. And most recently, we found that not only does it just pile up, the cell kind of throws it out. So um, uh, we find that if we study the, the growth medium the cells are uh, living in, um, it's a bit like um, a passenger ferry sort of throwing the rubbish overboard because they can't process it, if you like. Um, so it accumulates in the sea, and we're finding uh, an accumulation of this protein in the, the, the cell medium we're growing them in. So we're looking at that now, and that immediately means that you know, maybe some of these pathways are targets we could process for potential therapies. So where does all this work go? Well. Um, uh, yesterday and today, I was at a meeting of an organisation called STEM Bank, which is a large a European Union uh, stem cell programme to try to, to make a lot of these stem cell lines to study disease. It's been going for uh, two years now. It's a five-year programme. Uh, many industrial and academic collaborators. It's costing a lot of money, and we're making stem cells from, uh, over, for, from 500 patients of patients defined as diseases of our time by the European Union, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, <coughs> schizophrenia, bipolar, other neurological diseases, plus diabetes. So this work is underway with the idea we can identify patients, make the stem cells, and use those to make cells of interest to study diseases. So um, to wrap up, the stem cell technology is really advancing the way that we're studying neurological diseases, particularly here in Oxford. So I've told you a bit about the work in, in Parkinson's, and that's kind of led the way. But uh, there are programs uh, catching up and doing good work in Oxford on studying Alzheimer's disease. In this case, we're not making dopamine neurons. We're making cortical neurons, the bit neurons here that make you think, and also uh, working on motor neuron disease. So we can also make motor neurons from these stem cells as well. And having the three running together here in Oxford is very powerful because many of the disease processes where we have protein aggregation occurring, proteins not being degraded properly, maybe the mitochondria uh, are suffering, um, and we need the ability to study these mature age neurons. Many of the same issues, um, but it's really good that in, within Oxford we have these three disease programs underway. So just to finish with a huge thank you to Michelle and her colleagues um, uh, for the, the collection of the patient samples, to Sally and Jane for the reprogramming, to my guys who are working extremely hard 
on this in the lab and uh, all you members of the Discovery cohort for your time and skin samples. Thank you very much.